Welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast, the must listen to podcast for students of counseling and psychotherapy. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hello, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? I'm well, Rory. I've got a big smile on my dial today. Uh, thank you to you, our listener, for joining us. It is episode 179 of the Counselling Tutor Podcast. The reason I'm smiling and giggling is because this is take two, you see. We do the podcast, and we've just, I've, I've just botched a, a take. So this one, hopefully, fingers crossed, is the one we've got in episode 179 for you. Three sections we're going to be covering. The first one is called Student Check-In, where we look at something that students may come across during their studies and today we'll be speaking about the student research project. Uh, We're then going into digital counselling revolution where we recognise that uh, technology is now used in how counselling and therapy is delivered by us as counsellors and received by our clients. And we're going to be speaking about a new textbook that has come to market called Online and Telephone Counselling, a Practitioner Guide. Uh, And then we're going to go into Practice Matters, where we bring a brand new section today called Peak into Practice. And in Peak into Practice, we're going to be uh, having getting an overview of the day-to-day runnings of somebody's practice. So we're not going to an expert because we believe we are all experts in the way that we deliver our own practice. But uh, people from around the world, different modalities, different ways of working, just speaking about the day-to-day running of their practice. And today we're going to be speaking to our very own Rory Lees Oaks. So stick around for that one. But kicking us off, student check-in, student research project, Rory. I know that every student, no matter what modality you're studying, if you're going to go right to the end and become a qualified counsellor, along your journey, you're going to be required to do a research project. Absolutely, Ken. And um, I think that it's it's a, <clears throat> at the time this podcast is being broadcast, which is, is February of 2021, a lot of students, certainly who are doing in their second year of diploma or maybe going through their um, last, last part of their degree, will be looking for um, ideas for research and how to, how to plan their research out. And um, as someone who's done a research project, I'll, I'll pass on some very, very wise words given to me by my tutor a long time ago. And that was, be sure you could deliver the research project for the time that you've got and as someone who taught, I think one of the things that I'd, I'd kind of share with anybody who's thinking of planning a research project is, yes, think about what your project is, but also think about, <clears throat> can you deliver it within the time frame that you're being asked? Um, I can remember um, uh, at my tutor saying to me, you know, she didn't want any excuses that we'd, we'd I'd written because it was writing in those days. You know, it was, it was, it was email was just coming to be uh, a thing uh, uh, don't come to me saying you've written to dave Mearns, <clears throat> very famous person said to therapist uh, to get an interview or to ask some questions and he hasn't replied to you and the 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 basis of it was is that at some point you're gonna have to submit this and if it isn't complete that could be a problem so have a think about when you're thinking about a topic think about mm. is it viable to research um, before yeah. you before you start off in the time you've got. Yeah, I think the, the, I love that, <clears throat> Rory, because it starts with the topic of what you are going to research. And um, I remember when I did my research project, we, we came up with a load of different topics. And you can get really excited about topics that might interest you and, and might be very interested in, in, interesting indeed. But for my research project, we had about eight weeks to get the information, put everything together, Um, uh, uh, get some kind of outcomes from that and do a presentation eight weeks short period of time what you don't want is to pick a topic that's going to be incredibly difficult to get the information for Uh, so we eventually picked a, a topic that was maybe a little less interesting to us Rory but easier to get the data because like you say if you don't get over the finish line uh wow not worth doing the research. Of course, if you have the the um, luxury of time to do it, then of course you can dig a little bit deeper. Yes, and I think if you're doing sort of a level four, level five qualification um, in in England, level eight in uh, for our friends in Scotland, um, you you're only going to have a limited limited amount of time. So be thoughtful where you can get your information from. Where where do you get the secondary research? 
So in other words, the research that's been done before that you can comment on, I think that a lot of people, when they start the research, if they haven't done it before, don't realise that you have a you have an idea, and then as part of that, you look at you look at what other people's ideas have been, the research that's already out there. Sometimes it's called secondary research. Yours is primary research, so you're doing new research, and I think a, a good research project should sum up what you've found out. You may find that in your research, you've found exactly what other researchers have found. However, the, I've, I've, I've seen some really good research projects where the research that the person's carried out has actually been contrary to research that's been published. And this is at level four. And the question then is, where next? Where next for your research? Do you then, do you then think about, well, if I'm going to do, say, a degree where you've probably got a, a little a little more time to do research are you going to build on that and of course if you've got a, if you're doing a master's degree it's almost all research based a master's so you've got a lot more time and you're going to have to go be a lot more critical but i think it comes down to finding out what you're going to study looking at time you've got is it viable and please is it connected to counseling i've had some really interesting research proposals but some of them have got really very little to do with counseling and i think if you're doing a counseling qualification then you really need to be you really need to kind of not narrow but be very focused on on what it is you're researching and how it connects to counseling yes most definitely and so some some great tips there already the next tip that that i'd like to kind of bring in is that there are a number of different areas of the research. There's the potential of getting together with others. So maybe you're working on the research project as a group. So the group dynamics are going to form part of this whole process and how it plays out. So that is one area that really needs man managing so that everybody is on the same page so that time is not wasted kind of going over no let's rather do this but I thought we were going to do that kind of scenarios within any group what you're looking to do is to let to to elect someone who chooses to lead the group to have the final say to almost chair the group it doesn't put them in a higher position of power but it, it, it gives a final say in the group and helps with direction within that group so you've got your group that you might be working with and the dynamics within that that group you've got your research proposal Keep in mind when you're doing your research that this is all about writing it down, evidencing it and presenting it in the end, which is your third part. It's the presenting of your research. So it's uh, very easy to get lost in the excitement of the information that you're simulating and just popping down. At some stage, this is going to need to be written up, formally written up um, uh, and and handed in really so when you get your marks for it chances are you're going to be marked on uh, how your presentation went but you're also going to be marked on the submitted piece of work it's almost an assignment that you're putting in and often focus can be on the presentation because that's the fun bit let's let's face it or for some that is the the part where where there is anxiety standing up and 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 speaking to other people but it's uh, it's a good idea to recognize the focus on the two different parts, the handed in written piece of work and of course the presentation and how that's going to work. And of course, if you're working in a group, when it comes to the presentation, looking at a balance so that everybody gets a chance to be part of that presentation. Yes, and, and I, I, I think that when you did your uh, research project, Ken, and I, I remember it I remember it well, um, I think that there was a focus on on group work I think a lot of awarding bodies now are looking for individual presentations, but that doesn't mean you can't do it in a group. So I think if, if you are if you are looking as a, a group and you've got a really good idea, you may be doing post-traumatic stress. I think it's useful for each of each individual person to do their own research into one aspect of it. And that can be that could be quite an exciting presentation. So you might have three people in your group who are interested in post-traumatic stress. And it gives a chance to, to dig deeper, to do a deeper dive. One person can look at, say, how the amygdala works and the, the chemicals that, that alter the, the brain uh, in, in stressful times. Somebody else could look at the kind of support that uh, is given to people with post-traumatic stress. Someone may be wanting to do something on the history of post-traumatic stress. You know, it used to be called soldier's heart. 
um, in the First World War, and you could talk about, you know, its, its origins, the name of post-traumatic stress, how it only came into the textbooks in the in the kind of 1980s. Um, and so, that, so you, you could actually have three different presentations on one topic, but dig deeper, do a deeper dive. So I think I think there's some great great opportunities. Uh, but I would go back to my original point. Make sure you can deliver it in the time frame. There's, there's nothing worse than getting to the end. Yes, definitely. Of, of, yeah, and, and <laughs> find out you haven't done it. <laughs> yeah, you, you get a refer then, and, and that's not what you're looking not for. Um, so, I mean, we're speaking about research projects for for um, during studies here. Uh, and so here's some tips. And the, these tips are taken right out of the uh, counselling study resource library. So Rory and myself built a massive resource for students of counselling and psychotherapy. And it's really there to underpin your formal studies, uh, maybe take away the stress and give you a bit of a, a, a helping guide uh, in your studies. Um, and we, we've put together some stuff. It's Rory's Research Guide, it is called, and it pretty much goes in depth into a lot of different areas of research. And the purpose of the research presentation, this is what it's not for. You're not there to impress your audience. You're not there to tell them all you know about the given subject. You're not there to present every single little tiny detail of the subject that you've been studying or researching. What you're there for is to give the audience a sense of how your work aids their understanding. Make them want to use it. What can they take away and go, I now have something that I know and can use that I didn't know at the beginning of this presentation. And then get feedback. Get some way of getting feedback on your research. Nice thing is you should get extra marks for asking for that feedback as well. Keep in mind, it's important to know who your audience is. If you're presenting that research, who's going to be in front of you? So chances are it's going to be your tutor. You may have a relationship with your tutor. You know who they are. You know their personality. You're going to have your fellow students there. And keep in mind, they may be tired. Often when research presentations are done, multiple research presentations will be presented within a given session. And, and that can be quite fatiguing. Remember that they can read. You can use handouts. You don't have to have everything on a PowerPoint and read through it. You can hand handouts out that they can reference. They can read. Keep in mind that when you start, they may be thinking, why should I listen? So right at the beginning of your recent presentation, give them a good reason. And a good reason is what they will get out of it. Keeping in mind that people usually tune out of something they're not interested in within two minutes and you can get some early wins by right at the beginning be motivated be animated do something that may surprise them and talk about the value they're going to get out and when it comes to your slide presentations if you can show don't tell use visuals rather than bulk text with with on a powerpoint presentation and then leave your audience with these thoughts I understand why this research is important. If your audience is going, I understand why they chose this topic and why it's important. If they end by saying, I now have an idea of how, can, how I can apply this within my practice or clients. And if they're going, wow, that secondary research they presented was robust. I want to go and have a look at that. Then you have a winning research project. And there's just a, a, uh, a little bit, a little droplet from the counselling uh, study resource. If you're interested in counselling study resource, there's a whole research section in there. Go to counsellingtutor.com. Loads of info there. Absolutely. And actually, this question came up in our Facebook page. Um, a lot of people are posted in our Facebook page asking for ideas for research or be directed to uh, resources. And if you want to join our Facebook group, which is a vibrant group, thousands of like-minded people in the world of counselling and psychotherapy. We have tutors, we have students, we have um, uh, people who are qualified, all contributing. Go to Facebook, uh, type in counselling tutor. We're a closed group, knock on the door, answer the questions. And of course, we're going to let you in. And you too can ask your questions and uh, maybe uh, maybe use it as a base for your research. We do have a lot of people putting research questions into the Facebook group more and more. And uh, maybe you could use that to help you with your research project. 
Indeed. So there you go. That's our student check-in. Moving on now to our digital counselling revolution. Digital counselling revolution. Well, it's uh, it's certainly an exciting time, an exciting time for us because there is a new book out on the street in the uh, in the in the library, and it's called Online and Telephone Counselling: A Practitioner's Guide. Um, it's, it's no surprise to people that we have written a book to complement the online and telephone course that we've been running, and lots of you who are listening have probably gone through gone gone through that course. And we've 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 published a book, and the reason we published a book is because there's just so much information on online and telephone counselling. We wanted to make sure that anybody who's practising had a very concise, easy to access text. Um, that they could use just to um, help them with their knowledge, help their clients, and also gain a greater understanding of what is a fantastic new medium, which is here to stay. Indeed it is. And and we've spoken in this very section when we speak about digital counselling revolution, the the mass migration, as it would be, to working online, how we've kind of been catapulted maybe five to possibly 10 years into the future where working online has gone from uh, something that was maybe nice to do to something that is required. Um, And in doing so, the benefits and some of the challenges have started to show. Um, Rory and myself built the online and telephone counselling course. We've mentioned it a few times within this section. We've covered many of the topics and aspects of online therapy that we cover in our course. Uh, But uh, beavering away in the background, Rory and I have been writing this book, which has very, very kindly been edited by Sarah Carr from uh, Carr Consultancy. She is our academic writer. So she writes a lot of the content for counselling tutor.com. And she is a qualified therapist as well so has an understanding and Sarah has beautifully brought everything together and culminated all the ideas um the book is a textbook so it it would be very useful in the hands of any serious student of counseling that doesn't mean you have to be a student studying to become a counselor although this book would be perfect in your hands you could be an ongoing student as Rory and myself are recognizing that we need to do our continuous professional development to grow learn in service of our uh, clients by sharpening our competences this is a comprehensive book It goes into the ethics, it goes into the law, it delves down into data protection and and the paperwork side of what we need as a therapist. And along with the book is access to a companion course, which is, is hosted online. So when you buy the book, within the first few pages, it tells you how to access the companion course free of charge. It comes with the price of the book. And within that companion course, we've made templates of the paperwork, example templates of the paperwork that you will need in your practice. It's there, you can download it. We don't recommend you use the templates. We're not putting the templates out and saying, these are the templates you should use. These are best practice templates. We put them in as examples so that you can kind of have a starting place for building your own templates for your own business. But there are a lot of templates that are different in the book uh, than, uh, well, sorry, different when working online than would be face to face. And I'll run you through the chapters. Chapter one is about getting started with online counseling. We cover your online mindset, your initial contact. So that is when a, a, a potential client might get in contact with you, how you reply to that. We take a look at your relationship with technology. It also covers what your client's relationship with technology may be and we've covered many of these topics in our podcast also presenting online counseling to your client in other words putting your offer out of what you offer and how you do it checking suitability and assessing a client whether they are right fit for you Uh, We go into things like the disinhibition effect online contracting using the right technology All of that is just in chapter one, and this is a six-chapter book, 183 pages, absolutely jam-packed with what you will know to guide you as a practitioner of online and telephone counselling. Absolutely, and I think looking at those chapters, we can see it is a reference book. 
So I could see people using this if they've got <clears throat> maybe a question that needs answering um, about online and siphon counselling, go into the chapters, go into the index. Almost certainly it's been covered in this. Um, and it's to help you gain confidence in your practice. For a lot of people, online working only came about because of the COVID epidemic. And uh, some people are very new to this. You know, we've had a lot of people say to us that it's a bit like starting their counselling practice again, literally from scratch, because, you know, they were taught in, in, in the room work. They were, taught to, they were taught about how to work with clients literally sat in front of them. And now um, having to work online is, is, can, be, can be quite a challenge. It can be quite a step change. So the book is going to be really, really helpful to help you gain confidence, help you answer some questions you might not be able to get very quickly. You can go into the book and, you know, things like the initial contact, you know, how does that work? That's something that's quite different in online than it is on, than it is in, in the room or, or face-to-face therapy. <clears throat> and I think what the book does is help with something we've seen quite, quite um, prevalent in people who are converting or working online, and that's online mindset, helping people really understand and be comfortable um, working online in the service of their clients. Yeah, and it, it's it's an exciting time. It's an interesting time, I guess. Um, there's considerations in working online that we don't that, that they're not foremost in mind, and we're grateful to have been running the course to literally thousands and thousands and thousands of therapists. And we've seen what questions come up again and again and again. We've tried as best we can to answer those questions in the book. And it's it's things that we didn't make necessarily consider uh, when we were putting the course together. And of course, the course has, has, has evolved and grown during this time as well. But it's things like when you're working maybe uh, via video software with a client, and they're seeing themselves. So you, you you meet with them and they're there to see you. And in face-to-face, they would just see you in their therapy room. But all of a sudden, they're staring at themselves because there they are on the screen. And what effect that may have. So it really goes into the nuance of online and telephone counselling. Now, it's called Online and Telephone Counselling, A Practitioner Guide. Uh, and you can find the book on Amazon. If you go on Amazon and put Online and Telephone Counselling, it will come up there for you. But we also do cover email based counselling and text-based counselling in the book as well. Um, we don't go into great depth into email and text counselling, uh, uh, mainly because uh, what you need in email and text-based counselling is to have the understanding of it, you're still working online, so you still have to have the understanding of the law, the ethics, the paperwork. All, a lot of the processes are exactly the same as as with, whether you would be working via video or via telephone but we do cover that as well as well as looking at us as practitioners things like our supervision how we use that when working online our self-care as well and getting evaluation and feedback from our clients and of course the last section of the book we look at moving forward what online counseling looks like going forward what we can do um, with our skills as as online workers couldn't mention the book without putting in a disclaimer And the disclaimer is, um, you can't buy the book, read the book, and consider yourself an online and telephone practitioner. The book is a textbook giving information. In the same way as you can't buy a textbook on driving a car, sit and have a quick read and go, well, there you go there, where's the car, I'm off. Um, The book is there as a guide that any online and telephone work you need you, you need to have practice. You need to have practice in a structured environment. You need to work with peers. You need to have feedback on what's working, what's not working. In the same way as we do with our formal studies. Yes, we learn the theory. Yes, we learn the law. Yes, we learn the ethics. But at the end of the day, it's the practice we do during training that enables us to work with our clients. And the same is true. Uh, we need the exper- experiential aspect of online and telephone counselling to be to call ourselves a qualified practitioner, but the book certainly covers what you need to have in place, the theory and the ethics that underpin that, and various ways of working online. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. And I'd second uh, your observation. It doesn't make you an online um, and telephone counsellor, but it is mighty going to be mighty helpful um, for those of you who are in practice, <clears throat> or maybe those of you who are maybe students and you're coming up to your practice time 
and you'll you'll realize in that working in the room or face to face isn't 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 plausible now you you can buy this as a primer to get yourself a, a real solid understanding before you perhaps you go on to more formal training to be able to allow you to work and, and do your practice hours. So whether you're a qualified practitioner or a student who's on their journey into becoming qualified, this book is going to be mighty handy for you. Indeed. So there you have it. Uh, we are glad to take this section to kind of speak about that today. Um, I think it really keys into the topics that we've brought over the last uh, number of episodes in in this section of looking at uh, the digital counseling revolution we're very proud of it very proud to bring this to market we hope that it will serve many counselors and enable us to sharpen our competence in service of our uh, clients because that is the the, the purpose of this book uh, and again the book does come with a companion course it's a light overview or an introduction to online and telephone counseling it's a 10 hour course um, that is that comes as, as complementary with the book uh, it comes with all the download templates and you can get it from amazon uh, by just putting in online and telephone counseling it should come up in that search or you can go to counselingtutor.com click on our shop tab and we've got a books section there where we have our uh, other textbooks as well. And of course, you can select it from there if you choose. There it is. That is our Digital Counseling Revolution section. And we're now going into practice matters where we're going to do something new and exciting. And we're going to be doing a peek into practice. Practice matters. So this is interesting. We're going into something quite different. Uh, we're going to do a peek into practice. Peek into practice is where we speak to a practitioner, a counsellor, just like ourselves. Uh, not necessarily an expert because we recognise we are all experts in our own practice. It's what we do. It's what we run. But many of us run different kinds of practice. Maybe from around the world, we work differently. And we thought it'd be really interesting to just speak about the day-to-day -day running, what happens within a practice. And today, I'm very grateful to be speaking to my friend, my colleague, my fellow director and counselling tutor, Mr. Rory Lees Oaks. How are you doing, Rory? Oh, I'm, I'm all right, Ken. Thank you very much. I, I, feel, I feel like a real guest on, on, on my own podcast. Oh, yes, exactly. Welcome to your podcast, our podcast. Here it is. Well, um, Rory, the reason we, we wanted to kind of just highlight this, this new section, uh, and I think before we go into having a chat, Rory, I want to invite you, if you're listening to this and you want uh, as to maybe consider you to have a peek into your practice, uh, then drop us an email and you can email rory at counsellingtutor.com because Rory oversees our podcasts and, and, and speaks to our guests if you're interested. And, and tell us a little bit about who you are, where you are in the world, what modality you work and what kind of topics you'd like to discuss about your practice. And we'll give you an example now uh, by delving into your practice, Rory. And we're going back a few years now because you stepped out of this practice, but still relevant because you've got the experience and you've got the knowledge. And that is working as a school counsellor give us an overview of what it's like to be a school counsellor you wake up in the morning and then well I, I, I used to have quite a long drive um because I, I worked in Warrington um and I taught in Warrington and my my, my counselling practice was in Warrington so I get up quite early in the morning uh probably five or six o'clock and and drive mainly because the motorway uh, between where I live and um Warrington was quite busy and then I would uh, usually nip into uh, a well-known fast food restaurant and get myself a, a bacon bap and a cup of coffee, <clears throat> and then uh, ha and then kind of set up for the morning. I would I would go into the I would go into the school that I worked at, and uh, I worked at a lovely school with with wonderful wonderful people. And I'm I'm mindful as I'm speaking that some of the people I've worked with, both the staff and and the students that I, I had the privilege of. Of, of trying to kind of help maybe listening to this. And I, I, so I had a wonderful time, met some lovely people. Uh, but school counselling is entirely different to working uh, maybe in an agency, um, working with adults. There are so many different dynamics. And I think one of the dynamics that came to light was when I decided to do some child and adolescent training, I was doing my training. 
and um, we all had to, we were all in a group and we were asked where we practiced. Some were private practitioners, some worked for <clears throat> work friends Italy with children, children who were in the criminal justice system or, had, or were victims of crime. And I said, I worked, I work in a school and the trainer, and <clears throat> I always remember this, said to me, not the greatest place to do therapy. And I thought, well, that's a bit, that's a bit cruel. But in retrospect, and with great respect to anybody who's a school counsellor, any, anybody who's listening who's having therapy, schools are set up generally to educate people. Mm. <clears throat> and they have systems and uh, ways of working that are about education, and rightly so. You know, the clue is in the name. And I think that sometimes there are aspects of, of working in a school where you where, where being a therapist bumps a little bit. Yeah, <clears throat> as I'm listening think, to you saying that, I'm going to give you a chance to clear your throat there, Rory, because I can see the frog has jumped in there. Yes. As as you kind of saying that, I recognise what you're saying, and I think back to my my years as as of going to school when I was a student at school, and I went there to learn. It had a very specific feel. School. When I think back to school, I can I can almost smell it. I can almost feel what it was like to be there. There was a certain smell in my school and a kind of feeling when I was in there, and I don't associate that with being warm and supportive like a counseling relationship is so that feels like quite a challenge how how do you create that environment in an environment which is very clearly different well yes and i i think that i think that is the first thing um to consider your own school experience um you know schools are very very different um environments to to where myself and yourself would have been educated um and, and perhaps that's a that's a that's a topic for another podcast ken um but nowadays they're really warm inclusive places but one of the major differences is that the staff although they have lots of training and lots of pastoral training they're not they're not counselors or psychotherapists so there's always so much they can do and sometimes you get you get a young person referred to you as um and this is how the language has changed has challenging behavior that would be something that would come up this 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 student has real challenging behavior nowadays the language would be distressing behavior there's an acknowledgement that a behavior that is disruptive in the classroom is is a sign of a child's distress that that needs that needs to be looked at and help the, the child needs to be helped so sometimes the child comes to you with this little label attached to them, a young person saying that they are naughty or they're disruptive or they are this, that and the other. And as a therapist, you have to start to work through that. And what's really important is that you are seen as the school counsellor, not an adjunct to the teaching team. Ah. So so that is really, really important. I, I, can, I can remember um, one Christmas, everybody was told to wear Christmas jumpers. Now, I... I have an aversion to jumpers at the best of times. I don't wear jumpers. And I was the only person in the, in the school who wasn't wearing a jumper with a picture of Santa Claus or reindeer or all that type of thing. And um, the reason for that was I, I always wanted to be seen as someone outside the school. But, and this is, this is, the, this is the, the balance you have to the tightrope you walk, who work within the policies and procedures of the school. So as a school counsellor, you've got to balance your own ethics and the ethics of your profession and the rights of children against the, or, or alongside, let's not use the word against, work together, alongside the policies and procedures of the, of the school. And that is where you have a sit down with the pastoral team. You look at their policies and procedures and you talk about what you can do and you think about confidentiality and you talk about, you know what the, the thing is is that if you have to disclose everything a child's a young person has said to you a child or a young person has said to you they won't tell you anything there has to be a time i think where they can tell you a confidence without without you having to go back and reporting it so it is a very very fine balance and i think that is about negotiating with colleagues right at the beginning of your practice to find out what can be reported what leeway you have and to make sure the young person sees you as an independent person, not an adjunct 
to the teaching team. So, so very much considering the boundaries are different when working in a in a school environment. And you you mentioned Rory that kind of this this young person appears in front of you and may appear with a with a label. And one of the things that came up for me is 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 this person appearing in front of you because potentially a teacher has identified what they think is a challenge or an issue and said what you need is to go to the counsellor and I'm thinking back to we can't send somebody for counselling counselling should be something that you that you seek out or look for but I could see within a school environment that somebody might be almost sent to the counsellor has that happened did you have any experience of that I, I'm not going to start. Uh, clearly, I'm not going to talk about specifics, but there's there's, there's lots of times where where a, a young person would be presented to me, and said, and, and it would be, well, this person needs needs counselling, and um, you know, I could think of a, a number of com- I could think of one particular conversation which I won't go into in, in any depth, but I I, could, I I spoke to a lot of young people who said, you know, I don't want counselling, <laughs> I don't want it. I'm just, you know, you know the problem, the, and and quite frankly, the problem is me. The problem is the teacher, and when they outline what the difficulty is, um, you know, maybe it was about maybe the teacher not quite understanding where the mm. young person was. Um, I, you know, I, I think that teachers have, um, as speaking as a teacher myself, and my daughter is a teacher. She works in special needs with with children with special needs in the pastoral um, area of of, of education. Um, children have very can have very very difficult lives. Children and young people, and sometimes teachers just just aren't equipped to work with that. They're, they're you know they they do a lot of training and they do a great job. I don't want to be knocking teachers here, but they, it's not a specific discipline. And I think that you know teachers have a lot on the plate. So you know it may be that they're struggling to get people through a class. Someone's someone is showing this kind of distressed behaviour. They send them to the school counsellor, and it may be that the, the difficulty is actually with the teacher. Yeah, I'm I'm so pleased to hear that that autonomy, the client autonomy, still exists, and 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 quite rightly so. And it's as simple as asking the person who appears in front of you whether they choose to be there. I guess, yeah, uh, and whether that is their choice. That 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 is interesting. And then I guess. Um, what I also you you mentioned the confidentiality and how confidentiality is managed differently, and I I can I I wonder if if again that there's not kind of an investment from from a teacher because they say I, I would imagine that teacher who might be signposting someone is doing so because they care and they want to make a difference yes. and they they want they they're acting in service of yes. um, of um, that they would maybe want to share a little bit of that journey and want to know how they're getting on which in counseling of course we can't tell how people are getting on yes yes i mean the thing is in school communities there's this there's this kind of um collegiate um at- attitude where every, every 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 teacher may know a certain child and they may catch up with someone in classroom say how's you know how's rihanna doing today you know, she, she was struggling in my class and, and I wonder how she's doing in yours. And that is lovely and kind and really to the essence of being a caring teacher. The difficulty with that is if you're a school counsellor, if you get a teacher colleague who asks that question, you are in a bit of a, a bit of a difficult position because you're not, you, you cannot react like you're a, you're, you're a teaching colleague. You have to be very thoughtful about what you can say because you're working with confidentiality you know you're working within what's called gillick competence and um sometimes you know and, and i'll hold my hands up sometimes maybe i'm not handled handled it correctly certainly if it's first thing in the morning after getting up at five o'clock to drive to drive drive sometimes it could come over as that you're being defensive or aloof or um just just not being very cooperative and i used to have to explain to my teaching colleagues that there's things I can share, there's things I can't, and and um, eventually I think I think mm. they, they understood that. But I think and I think that you know and and you know I've explained we have a teaching family. I think sometimes teachers, if they're not getting the answers they want, can sometimes be become quite forceful. So I think you have to be quite tough mm. to be able to say to a teaching colleague, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm afraid that 
there's only so much you can say, you know, and maybe refer them to the pastoral team who've got who've got a, who will have a an overview of that young person. But yeah, um, now that's it. That, as as you're saying that, Rory, it, it it feels to me that part of the duty of being a counsellor working in a school is that of education, educating the, yes. the surrounding staff of what counselling is and how it works, because mm. of course they won't know. I mean, we, when we go to, to study counselling, we the fir- one of the first lessons is what is counselling and what counselling is not. Uh, they wouldn't understand the boundaries, the confidentiality, the role of a yeah. counsellor. So part of that is, I guess, being patient as you, as you clearly were and explaining as politely as one can and i i can understand through gritted teeth at, at, at when you've been up at five o'clock in the morning and, you, and now this is the 15th person that's asking you the same kind of question because yeah. <laughs> you can only do it on a one-to-one basis yeah. so I, I mean with this peak into practice rory one of the things i'm getting is how much it is different and it feels very personal to you you speak with passion uh, i can see yes. that it, it feels to me you speak with love when you speak and respect of the of the people that you have worked with one of the final things that i just wanted to close on is the modality so we 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 study a modality and that modality is what we practice can we take our base modality as it is clean and pure take that into a school and here we go no that's, well that's, that's been that's the counseling <laughs> due to podcast <laughs> no i i think i think i think the first thing to understand is 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 children aren't adults young people are adults so so a lot of meta models of theory were developed around adult experience adult phenomenology and i think it was maurice merleau ponte who who rightly identified children have a different phenomenology. Their views of the world are are, are informed differently. Um, And I would would urge anybody, really anybody, to do some form of child and adolescent therapy training. Uh, I did did mine quite early, and it opened my practice up to to the benefit of my clients. And, you know, one of the things that young people really can't, can't, struggle with is silence you know there was very little silence in my practice it was it was all conversation I, I used a lot more questions than maybe you would in in a traditional person-centered canon of of working um so yes you have to you, you, you have to adapt it and and also time sometimes half an hour not an hour Ooh. maybe a young person could uh, yeah lots of I had a big toolbox in fact, funny enough, it's got my tool, my little box I used to carry on my cranes and all my creative art stuff. He's now actually got tools in. I lifted this out to do a job the other day, and it, it's got Rory's box. Do not remove on it. Oh. Um, and uh, now it's used for tools because, of course, I don't I don't counsel children. Um, but yes, and and you're right. I have very, very, very fond memories of the young people whose lives um, I heard about, and um, and you're right. There is this there is this sense of there is this sense of appropriate love for those whose whose lives that they shared with me, and um, they do rattle around in my head. I think, and I think the interesting thing is they they rattle around in my head more than maybe my my adult clients. I often I often find myself. I'm not a very wistful person, but occasionally I'll, I'll I'm, I may be kind of having a cup of tea and staring out of the window, and all of a sudden I think I wonder what ever happened to dot 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 dot, and. Um, and I'm sure, and I know that some of them became therapists, and uh, so yeah. But uh, yeah, and and also the staff. You know, I I can't say enough about the staff where 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 I um, were. They were they were wonderful people, as in teaching under incredible pressure. Um, but it's a wonderful environment and such an important environment because our childhood sets the foundations for the rest of our life. Such important work, Rory work you speak about with passion i have an unfair advantage to you our listener in that uh, we record our podcasts and uh, our interviews over skype and i can see rory and as as you're speaking rory your eyes light up and there is a massive smile on your face when you speak about the important work that you did thank you for being our first guest into in peak into practice and uh, to you our listener Tell us about your practice. If if you feel you've got something to talk about, your practice, get in contact. Rory at counsellingtutor.com. Send an email. We'd love to hear from you. We can't 
have everybody on because we only have a limited amount of podcasts because we only do one a week but we'd certainly love to hear from you uh, uh, and tell us a little bit about who you are what your practice entails your modality where you are in the work uh, in the world <laughs> in the work in the world and a couple of points that you th- that, that, that you are passionate about about your practice uh, and who knows you may very well one day be listening to yourself on peak into practice and of course just before we end this episode to just recognize Rory you spoke about doing your uh, uh, children adolescent your young person adolescent training early on we say it all the time CPD is where it's at Uh, Rory and I have built a library of CPD lectures and I do know within that library we have got a lecture on uh, children and adolescent therapy and I can share letting a peek into the bag that we are working with one of the UK's top training providers uh, to bring a course a, a course on a on uh, working with young people sometime in the future so watch this space if you're interested in joining the CPD library it's a uh, affordable once-off payment which gives you access to a full year to hundreds of hours of CPD lectures Uh, you can get information at counsellingtutor.com yeah so what an what an interesting episode we talked about research and planning your research project we went on to talk about our new book, Online and Telephone Counselling, A Practitioner's Guide. And then finally, I became um, the, the, the topic to podcast in the interview um, in, in to peek into practice where I talked about my experience of being a child therapist or working with young people. So as always, stay grounded, stay safe and hey, join the digital counselling revolution. If you're a qualified counsellor or psychotherapist, then why not check out the Counsellor CPD Library. Stay current with your CPD requirements with over 150 hours of academically rigorous, on-demand lectures you can stream to your device. Joining Counsellor CPD will expand your skill set to create a more specialised, highly rewarding practice. For more information on the Counsellor CPD Library, visit counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counselling Tutor podcast. Find the show notes for this episode on our website at www.counsellingtutor.com.